And we're in the prophecy of Jeremiah, chapter number 29. Jeremiah, chapter 29, please. And we're going to read from verse number 1. The book of the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 29, and commencing to read from verse number 1. Now, these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah, the prophet, sent from Jerusalem unto the residue of the elders, which were carried away captives unto the priests and to the prophets and to all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. After that, Jeconiah the king and the queen and the eunuchs and the princes of Judah and Jerusalem, and the carpenters and the smiths were departed from Jerusalem. By the hand of Elasa, the son of Shaphan, and Gemariah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent unto Babylon to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, unto all that are carried away captives, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem unto Babylon. Build ye houses, and dwell in them, and plant gardens, and eat the fruit of them, and take ye wives, and beget sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons, and give your daughters to husbands, that they may bear sons and daughters, that ye may be increased there and not diminished. And seek the peace of the city, whether I have caused you to be carried away captives. And pray unto the Lord for it, for in the peace thereof shall ye have peace. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, let not your prophets and your diviners that be in the midst of you deceive you, and neither hearken to your dreams which ye cause to be dreamed. For they prophesy falsely unto you in my name. I have not sent them, saith the Lord. For thus saith the Lord, that after seventy years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. And then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And ye shall seek me and find me, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. And I will be found of you, saith the Lord. And I will turn away your captivity, and I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places, whether I have driven you, saith the Lord, and I will bring you again into the place whence I caused you to be carried away captive. Amen. And we know that the Lord will add His blessing to the reading from His own precious truth this morning. One of the great exercises that a Christian can be involved in, and one that is great blessing, is to get away and to get alone with your Bible, and to get away and to get alone, and just to contemplate and to consider the great God and Savior that we really have. It's good to get away and to get alone with God, friends, and get your Bible with you and go through your Bible and to think and to look and to learn all about the great God and Savior that we really have. 
to think first of all perhaps of his, of his tenderness. For what a tender God and Savior that we have. Did the hymn writer not say, In tenderness he sought me when I was weary and sick with sin? You know, friends, this morning what a blessedness it is to think of the tenderness of our God. Especially when you see our God in the, in the epistle to the Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, we see there the tenderness of our great God and Savior. We learn in Hebrews 4 and 15 that we do not have an high priest which cannot be touched by the feelings of our infirmity. What a blessing to know, child of God, of the tenderness of our God, that our God and Savior is so tender that He's touched by the very feelings of our infirmities. Do you know something this morning? Our God is touched by the feeling of sorrow. Our God is touched when we're burdened and wearied. Our God is touched this morning by the very feelings of our infirmities. Because, you see, He wasn't always tempted as we are, but yet without, without sin. Ah, friend, you should get to know something of the tenderness of our God and of our Savior. And then when you look through the Scriptures, you'll not only learn something of the tenderness of our great God and Savior, but you'll learn something of the great forgiveness of our Lord and Savior. Where would any of us be here this morning if it wasn't for His forgiveness? One of the great pictures of His forgiveness has got to be Luke's Gospel 23 and verse 34. And you'll remember when the soldiers were nailing him to Calvary's cross, he prayed, Father, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. There's nobody so forgiving, and there's nobody more tender than our great God and our great Savior. In Psalm 103, in verse 12, we read, for as far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. What a blessing to know, child of God, and to get away alone with God, and to get to know God's tenderness, and to get to know God's forgiveness. Yes, and to get taken up with God's faithfulness. There's nobody more faithful than our God. You remember way back, and not so very far from when we have, where we have read this morning, do you know what we read in the book of the Lamentations of Jeremiah? In Lamentations 3 and verse 23, we read these words, Great is thy faithfulness. Tell me something, child of God. Have you ever proven God to be unfaithful? Have you ever known our God and Savior to be unfaithful? You remember what the psalmist said in Psalm 119, verse 90? Thy faithfulness is from generation to generation. And Paul said, God is faithful by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Sidlow Baxter says, though, tri though trials surge like stormy seas around, the, the testing fierce uh, like ambushed foes abound, yet this my soul and million mores has found. He never fails. He never fails. I wonder, child of God, this morning, do you know the tenderness of our great God and Savior? Friend, really know the forgiveness of our great God and Savior and the faithfulness of our great God and Savior? 
I think it's good, you know, when you learn something of the matchlessness of our great God and Savior, because the great God and Savior that you and I have this morning can be compared with. There's nobody like Him, you know. And there's nobody like our great God and Savior. David could say, O oh Lord, there is none like Thee, neither is there any God beside Thee, according to what we have heard with our ears. Yes, there's none like Him. Oh, friend, but God doesn't want to speak to us this morning concerning His tenderness. And He doesn't want to speak to our hearts this morning concerning His forgiveness. And He doesn't want to speak to our hearts this morning concerning His faithfulness. And He doesn't want to speak to us this morning concerning His matchlessness. Ah, but here's what God wants to speak to us this morning about. God wants to speak to us this morning concerning His thoughtfulness. Did you ever think this morning? Did you ever contemplate this morning? Have you ever considered this morning the great thoughtfulness of our great God and Savior? <laughs> There's nobody thinks like Him, you know. Have you ever learned how God thinks toward you and me? Well, you're going to find out this morning, and we're all going to learn, and it's found in my text, and you'll find it there. Jeremiah 29 and verse 11, this is what it says. And God is speaking, and He said, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an unexpected end. You know, this morning, this text, I want to keep it right in its context this morning. Because God was speaking to those who rebelled against Him. He was speaking to the people of Judah who were deported away down into pagan Babylon, away from everything that they knew. And when God was speaking these words, His people were just beginning their 70 years of captivity in Babylon. And even though these people rebelled against God, yet God wanted them to understand. He wanted them to know even though they rebelled against Him, yet He was not for forgetting about them. Even though they were in this dark and difficult place, He wanted to assure them that they were always on His mind. I often think of the father of the prodigal son. Boys, how many lessons do you get out of that one? Even though the prodigal this morning rebelled and went away into the far country and wasting his substance on red as living, and yet the father this morning, the father, the father went to bed and the last thoughts the father had was of the son this morning. When he woke up in the morning, the first thoughts he had was of the son that was far away. How God thinks this morning toward you and toward me. And I want you to notice, first of all, in that text this morning, there's the there's the reality of God's thought. Because God says, I know the thoughts, and there's an S on it. 
the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. You know, child of God, sometimes the thoughts that God has toward you, and sometimes the thoughts that God has towards me, they can be more conflicting rather than comforting. You remember who God is speaking to here. He's speaking to His people who have been deported away many miles into Babylon, dark Babylon. And God says to them, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, and they're thoughts of peace, not of evil. Could you imagine when that letter arrived and they read those words? You know, I know if I had been there that day, I'd have said, I write, here we are in a foreign land. Here we are away from everything you know, and the Lord's trying to tell me that He's thinking about me. You know, maybe this morning you're in a difficult place. Maybe this morning you're in a very dark place. Maybe this morning life is difficult for you. And you think this morning God has forgotten about you. And you think this morning that the Lord has not you on His mind, that the Lord has forgotten about you, almost perhaps maybe believe that He's forsaken about you. You're in a difficult place, maybe in a difficult job. And you've been applying for other jobs just to get out of where you are, and nothing's coming. And you're wondering, where is the Lord? You wonder, what's the Lord thinking? Some dilemma you face this morning, maybe it's in the home, maybe it's health, and child of God, nothing for you at this moment is making sense. Maybe you're facing an unbearable situation. I know someone at the moment who's facing a very serious accusation. And her husband says, where's God? There's something important that we need to learn as God's people. God would remind us all this morning in Isaiah 55 and 8. He says, you know, learn this wee lesson. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts your thoughts. And God wants to say to our hearts this morning, listen, I know the thoughts that I think toward you. Notice, they're individual thoughts. Child of God, listen, God thinks upon you, and He's thinking upon me as individuals this morning, not as a congregation. Sister, He's thinking upon you individually right now. He's thinking upon me individually right now. And God sees and God knows every area of our lives. God's thinking about you right now, child of God. His thoughts are upon every care that comes. His thoughts are upon every tear that flows down your cheeks. His thoughts are upon every trouble. His thoughts are upon every problem. His thoughts this morning are upon you in that situation where you see no hope. I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. Last Friday a week ago, our friend Heather 
woke up on the Friday morning and she discovered some of her hair lying on the pillow. She has gone through chemotherapy. And you ladies knows the pain of losing your hair if you ever had that experience. Her worst nightmare had come. It wasn't just the chemo, it was the thought of losing her hair. Tracy and I were with her in Mandeville unit when she was getting her first round of treatment. And she kept feeling her hair to see was her hair starting to come out. But last Friday morning, there it was. And another friend of ours, we weren't home from holidays rang her to say, Heather, do you want us to go with you to the hairdressers? Heather made the decision to go and have her head completely shaved. And in that dark moment, this is what Heather said, you're all right, she said. The Lord is with me. The Lord is with me. Heather Osborne knew that in that dark moment, she knew that God was thinking of her. That she was in his thoughts. I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. His thoughts are individual, they're intimate, they're infinite. And you know, child of God, listen to me. God knows every possible thing about you that there is to know, troubles and trials, joy and sorrow. But take a good wee look at that text again. There's not only, there's not only the, the reality of God's thoughts toward you and me, but, but there's the reasoning of God's thoughts towards me and you and me. Because he says this, these are the thoughts, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. Now, here's the reasoning of them. They're thoughts of peace, not of evil. Do you know that word peace is a very strong word? In the original Hebrew, it means shalom. And if you look it up in the concordance and in the dictionary, you'll find that that word means this morning. It means safety. God was speaking to these people. Listen, the thoughts that I'm thinking toward you, they're thoughts of safety. And the same word means well-being. The thoughts that I think toward you are for your well-being. And the same word means happy. Means happy. You see, God, God's thoughts toward you and me, child of God, are thoughts for our better being, for our well-being, thoughts of safety, thoughts for our well-being. He wants us to enjoy our salvation. But here's a people this morning who rebelled against Him. And God caused them this morning to be driven into captivity for this reason, to keep them safe from rebelling further. He did it for their well-being. 
And you know, child of God this morning, listen. Sometimes God has to use the rod of affliction. And when God has to use the rod of affliction and the hand of chastisement upon his own people, listen, it's for our own good. And God was saying to these people this morning, listen, I know the thoughts that I think towards you. They're thoughts of peace, not evil. I'm doing this for your good. You know, sometimes God allows things to come in. Because God has to chastise us. God has to rebuke us. Hebrews 12 and 6 says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. And if ye endure the chastening of the Lord, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? Do you know one of the greatest forgotten doctrines today is? Is the chastening of the Lord. We talk about the mercy of the Lord. We hear plenty about the love of the Lord, but how often do we hear concerning the chastening of the Lord? Proverbs 3.11 says, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord. I remember when I was a wee nipper, There was times I used to get into trouble, do things that I was told that I wasn't supposed to do. And my mother had a sally rod, and she could make that sally rod sing, and she could make me dance. And as many times I went against her, and many times she used to reach for it. And her and I had a wee game, and it was called Pig. For I ran, and the more I ran, the more she got mad. But she always finally caught up with me. And that's the day I used to wear wee short trousers. It made it worse. But you know, Did my mother enjoy doing it? No, she didn't. It was for my good. And let me tell you something right now. That wasn't child abuse. It wasn't child abuse. I'm glad she done it. And I'm thankful she did it. For God knows where it'd be the day if she hadn't. Have. And that's what's wrong with today's society. Parents aren't allowed to chastise their children anymore. Ah, but their children is allowed to chastise their parents. And no wonder society is haywire. When someone chastises you, I'm telling you it's part of their heart that really loves you. And you know, friend, God really loved these people. And he had to chastise them because he loved them so much. Ah, but he had to chastise them. But was God thought of them? It was thoughts of peace. It was all for their own good. Remember what the psalmist said in Psalm 119, 71? He says, it is good for me that I was afflicted. He looks back to a day when he was grievously afflicted. And the psalmist knew way back then the heavy hand of God that afflicted him. He felt the pain of it. But he looks at his present condition and he says, it is good for me that I was afflicted. And listen, child of God, Whatever kind of pain you're going through or whatever circumstance you're facing or situation, 
Here's what God wants you to know. I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. They're thoughts of peace, not evil. Why did my mother chastise me? Was it because she was a spoil sport? Was it because she didn't want me having any fun? No, no. It's all for my good. And you know, child of God, this morning, sometimes God has to use the rod of affliction even on me. And don't you for one minute think that I'm perfect for I'm not. He had to speak to the church and say, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. And maybe God is chastising some sister in here this morning. I don't know. Maybe the Lord is chastising some brother in here this morning. I don't know. But let me assure you, he's thinking towards your good this morning. God never thinks towards us in an evil way. It's for our good. Listen to what the Lord has to say. I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. They're thoughts of peace not of evil. Now look at the text again. You've got the results of his thoughts. Listen to it. To give you an expected end. And you know this morning as we just bring this message to a close, in spite of the dark situation where they were, God wanted His people to know this. There's a, hopeful, there's a hopeful end for them. Remember this, child of God, the finest pottery that ever appeared on any shelf or on any table had to go through the fire and the heat of the kiln to produce it. Why does the potter put the clay through the kiln to give it an expected end? It has to go through the fire to produce the beauty. In 1890, the Steed family left for a holiday on the beach at New York. 1890. Mr. Steed, his wife, and their daughter, Lily, it started off a beautiful day. Beautiful day. The family were making sandcastles. And as they were making sandcastles, Mr. Steed saw a man away out far in trouble. He was struggling to swim. Mr. Steed ran into the water swam out to him. And the man who was drowning got a hold of him and held him in the, in the death hold. You should never approach a drowning person at the front. You should always swim around their back and get them at, back, at, at behind. And the man who was drowning got a hold of him and held on to him and wouldn't let him go. And both of them that day perished. A godly man. His wife was a godly woman. And way back in 1890, there was no help for dependent children. Mrs. Steed had to do the best she could. Everything was seen to be running out. Three or four months after the tragedy,
There was nothing left to eat in the home. Not a thing. She was putting the wee girl to bed one night and she looked at her shoes, the wee girl's shoes, and the toes were out of them. They were far too wee. And the wee girl looks up and says, Mommy, why do you look so worried for? Because do you not realize that Jesus is thinking of us? I know he is, said the mommy. I know he is. Well, mommy, why don't you tell the Lord Jesus what we need? And so both of them prayed. We girl prayed first, and the mommy prayed. They had nothing in the home. They prayed, went to bed. Mrs. Steed got up early the next morning. She didn't know how she was going to face that day. She decided she would take a wee walk down the forest path that her home was built beside. She went to open the front door, but she felt something blocking her. She managed to push it up open far enough to put her head round, and there was a large box filled with groceries. And in that box there was an envelope with a $10 note. And beside it there was another parcel. And in that parcel there was a brand new pair of shoes. Just the right size for the wee lass. She brought the box in. And she sat it on the table and she emptied it out. It seemed never to end. And there she was. And she prepared breakfast and she called the wee girl down. And she was about to start to eat, and she says, Hold on a minute. I want to write something down. And this is what she wrote. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Tis so sweet to know the Lord. Just to rest upon his promise. Just to know. Thus saith the Lord, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him. How I've proved him o'er and o'er, Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. And no wonder the psalmist said in Psalm 139 and verse 17, How precious are thy thoughts unto me, O Lord. And child of God, here's what God wants to say to your heart. I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. They're thoughts of peace, not of evil. They give you an expected end. That's how God thinks toward you and me. And may God bless that word. To all of our hearts this morning. We're going to sing our closing hymn. It's